So uh, welcome everyone to our um, RF event on the implementation. Thanks a lot for taking the time and for being here with us today. Um, I think it's a perfect timing to have our event because we just voted on the RF implementation report in Parliament, basically looking back at the first um, year, if you want, of um, how, how the RF went. Um, and I think uh, there were a lot of interesting discussions about it. And I mean, if you also think about the fact that a couple of weeks ago, we had a rather tough discussion with uh, President von der Leyen, and I will come back to that. I think the, the, the time is uh, right and good. From um, our, our side, let me quickly introduce myself. I'm, I'm Damien Böselager. I was one of the negotiators of the RF um, originally and also then of the implementation report together with my colleague, um, Ernest Utersun, uh, who did the same uh, from the econo economy uh, committee, if you like, and I did it from the budget committee. Um, and uh, we will also be working together then on the Repower EU, which, as some of you know, will also affect the RF um, in its structure. So maybe as just a couple of introductory remarks before we come to the much more interesting intervention of um, the panelists. And um, I just wanted to say that obviously from the Greens perspective, we have been fighting already um, in the setup of the RF for a couple of priorities, including um, that we have uh, you know, green spending as actual green spending. So the whole methodology um, for green spending was you know, improved, let's say, in cooperation with the commission from our side, and we try to ensure that there's a strong do no significant harm principle, which basically means that none of the investments, so 100% of the investments, shouldn't um, harm the environment according to uh, like this principle. And we also try to um, fight for, um, and uh, with the strong help of Alexander Gese, who is also here today, for um, really assessing the and addressing the uh, gender specific impact of the crisis, because very shortly, as you might know, um, the corona really hit the service industry, which has a, a traditionally a higher, um, let's say, woman to man ratio, whereas often when we think about investment programs, they go into infrastructure and, and manufacturing where there's maybe um, a lower uh, woman to man ratio. So this is um, something that, that we try to fight for. And obviously what was also super important for us was that the uh, consultation with all stakeholders, be it NGOs, but also regional level um, authorities and so on, is, is open and, and transparent as much as possible. Um, within this, I mean, after the, let's say, negotiation closed and we started looking at the implementation, obviously for us, the first important phase was to look uh, and see and watch very carefully if the national recovery and resilience plans actually fulfill the criteria as set out by the co-legislators and we, uh, I mean, sent a couple of uh, concerned letters to the Commission. We also voiced our points multiple times in, in the different inter ex or like exchange formats that we have um, to, to see that we can basically still in the assessment of the national plans um, yeah, inform the Commission about potential issues that we, that we see. Um, overall, I think uh, the from our side, um, yeah, the RF is a success because it is a very unique instrument of allowing for an overall top-down, you know, prioritization for burden sharing to a certain extent in a really a big time of crisis, and also by setting a precedent for um, an instrument that could work across the European Union in times of need, and especially also is needs tailored, um, and so that's something that, that that's very interesting for us. And um, obviously, we do believe that we should have uh, some form of a more um, standing kind of uh, um, tool at hand. So the macroeconomic governance of the European Union could benefit from having an investment tool that would be able to react to the situations in, in the different member states. And if you look at what's happening now with the energy um, dependence differences in the different member states, we also believe that uh, it's a very important time to look at um, how we can support the green transition, but also the energy independence uh, that, that is needed and how we can shield ourselves against the sanction effects. And we have also published um, uh, yeah, a position in this regard, and we will publish uh, further positions in this regard, because we do believe that the need uh, for intervention will um, increase as the fiscal space of the different member states decreases, um, given rising inflation levels, but especially also given 
the uh, potentially rising unemployment numbers um, with a declining economy. So this just as a little introductory remark um, in terms of uh, the Greens being or Greens IFA being very positive about the RF, but also obviously um, very much concerned about its implementation. Maybe as one last overarching point, um, I think what we fought for from the beginning and that what we see now is also very necessary is to have um, more democratic oversight on the national level on how these plans are developed. And so I think none of the plans almost went to the national parliaments. I mean, not none, but very limited debate and uh, not sufficient consultation of national parliamentarians. Um, and obviously the European Parliament did not have hard power over the approval of the national recovery and resilience plans, which uh, I think backfired also if you look at the situation that uh, you know certain pressures um, led to the approval of the Polish recovery plan, even though and none of the conditions originally lined out um, for the improvement of the independence of the judiciary were given. Okay, so with this, um, I would love uh, to give the floor to um, our invited guests who I very much thank for um, coming here today and to discuss with us. With us. Um, um, Rosa, I would love uh, for you to mute, exactly, thank you. Um, so we have um, Erik von Beska, who's Director of Recover Task Force in, in the European Commission. We have Marta Hirsch Zimbinska, the Principal Advisor on Charter Compliance and the Directorate of Inquiries of the EU Ombudsman. And we have um, Albert Castellanos Maduel, uh, Secretary of Business and Competitiveness in the Ministry of Business and Labour of the Catalan uh, Government. Uh, so I think it's very interesting to have both the European level and also a region level represented here and also from a different perspectives. Um, we will also have Alexandra Gese and Rosa D'Amato, who are uh, fellow members in the European Parliament, um, with me here on the panel to also ask questions um, to our experts. And um, I think if it's okay for you, I would just, uh, you know, propose a first round of questions. And then um, I'm very happy to also just, you know, have you each react to each other. And let's have an open debate and discussion. And I think that would be very helpful to also then, you know, open the floor. So maybe I can actually start um, with you, Mr. Van Breska, on uh, the question of how do you see, you know, the effective uh, monitoring of, uh, of the national implementation? Do you, I mean, where do you see risks? How do you handle them? How do you deal with, for example, and especially for us importantly, um, the um, yeah, compliance with the do no significant harm principle? And obviously you can combine that with your introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I thank you first of all for inviting me. Thank you very much um, um, for 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 being with with you and the other members of the panel today. Um, I will be very brief with my introductory remarks. I just would want maybe just to say a few words on where we stand and what we think is is let's say are the the the, the big novelties or so. And there are some uh, because you as you rightly said, Damien. Um, I think uh, one year ago the first plan was adopted. Uh, now we have 25. The last one was on Poland, as you have rightly pointed out. This triggered some discussion uh, without surprise, I guess. Um, uh, and I'm happy also to, to, to discuss the Polish plan because I was one of the negotiators uh, with, for the discussion with Poland. Uh, so I know a bit about uh, the content. Um, but maybe what I can just say at, at the beginning, I think um, what we should not forget, uh, this is really a new instrument. I mean, an instrument which, to my knowledge, is not implemented anywhere around the world. And there are two distinctive features. I think the first one is that it's performance based. And uh, when you think about it also, I mean, there is no national administration, at least to my knowledge, which in fact doesn't work on the basis of invoices. Everybody feels safe if I have an invoice. Here, we are not speaking about costs. We are not speaking about invoices. We are just speaking about achieving certain targets which were discussed and agreed beforehand. And this required a complete uh, change in, in terms of mindset, both in the Commission, but also with member states, because nobody is used working like this. And the second thing, which I think is also a novelty unheard of, in my view, is that we are not only supporting investments, but we are also supporting reforms. And, and again, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, this is quite uh, uh, um, uh, amazing, because what we have right now in the plans is, in my view, uh, the most ambitious reform agenda which the Union has ever seen. Um, because, uh, as you probably know, the anchor for these reforms discussion uh, are the country-specific recommendations which 
are issued uh, by the Commission and then adopted by Council. And, and we have most of these uh, reform requests, which are expressed in these uh, recommendations, have been picked up by the plans. And so I would uh, again say that for the first time, we are addressing, in fact, a significant number of country-specific recommendations, because before there was no such drive or so. I mean, maybe in times of crisis, you know, like when you really had difficulty, remember the banking crisis and so on, certain reforms were implemented, but but that's quite amazing. And, and I'm also following Italy, just to tell you, I mean, what we have in the Italian plan, justice reform, education reform, labor market reform, public finance reform. I mean, you, you, you circular economy, waste management reform. I mean, it's really very comprehensive. So I think that is really, uh, amazing, and, and uh, we also think this will increase, in fact, the resilience uh, of our economies and societies going forward. Now, this takes me to the second point, which is on investments. I think also here, I mean, the good thing is, and I mean, we have already pointed out, I mean, uh, we have a focus on the green transition. So as of now, we expect more than 200 billion euro to be invested in supporting um, uh, our green ambition and more than 100 billion to support the digital transformation. And, and as of today, so one year after the adoption of the first plan, we have already dispersed to member states more than 100 billion euro. So just to, to again tell you um, that, that the, 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 project, uh, the project and the plans are up and running and implementation in fact is taking place as we speak. So we are, in fact, quite fast uh, in terms of implementation. Um, what I would also want to say, and again, you have mentioned it, Damien, I think um, the whole thing obviously started with the COVID crisis. But now, I mean, when you look around, we are facing many other crises. You mentioned inflation, energy independence, um, as supply chain interruptions. I mean, it, uh, refugee inflows from the war in Ukraine. And, and as you have also mentioned, I think um, we think that given the flexibility of the, of the recovery facility, but also given the fact that there are more than 220 billion euro of loan support still outstanding at very, very favorable conditions, um, that the RF uh, should also be used in order to address these new challenges. And back in May, and you have certainly read it um, and, and, and already probably commented on it, uh, we had um, the Repower EU proposal of the Commission. And, and when you read this uh, carefully, you will see that the RF is supposed to play a central role also on this question of, for example, security of energy supply. So basically, I think um, um, uh, so far um, what we see is, is quite a fast implementation. What we see is that the, the, the key challenges are addressed and we hope that obviously, given that the RF is very agile um, and, and flexible, it could also play a role in addressing these new challenges which nobody had on the radar screen um, during the COVID crisis. Um, I, maybe then just one or two words to reply to your, to your questions. I mean, on, on, on um, I think what, what um, basically at the end of the day um, matters, I think also in terms of implementation is ownership, ownership by the member states, ownership on the ground, you know, like civil society, regional local authorities, um, social economic partners, because if this is really just, you know, like a top-down project, which ends at the government level, this will not be a long-term success. And here, um, First of all, we are very happy about the support and also about your push, pushing also us uh, to make sure that there's a more comprehensive involvement of the stakeholders in the member states, because this clearly is a key for success, uh, otherwise it will not work. Um, and, and, and again, when I think about Italy, more than one third of all the investments are in the hands of regional and local authorities. So it's not you know, like a distant ministry in Rome, which is responsible for, for, for a big chunk of the plan. It's really the people on the ground, the administrations on the ground, which also have a stake in, in, in the implementation. And the other thing, which is I think also very important is, is transparency. I mean, and, and again, um, also here, I think um, the European parliament and, and national parliaments have a key role to play. Uh, to make sure that citizens are well aware and uh, about what is happening around them and that they play a role. And transparency also, and this brings me to your question about what are 
you know, like how do we monitor and what are our concerns? And you mentioned the do no significant harm principle and how do we make sure that this is actually implemented? And the way how we do it is first of all, upfront when we define the investments together with the member states, uh, we uh, ensure that, for example, in the calls for tenders for the projects, um, the do no significant harm requirements are enshrined so that this has been taken care of. That's number one. And then number two, um, we obviously, when we receive a payment request, we also check usually on the basis of some samples. So we will not look at each and every project, uh, um, but we will look at some projects to see whether indeed in terms of project implementation, these criteria were respected. And this brings me back to the transparency issue. We are obviously then listening also to, for example, what NGOs tell us. Um, and if we, for example, get um, information that some, uh, for example, environmental NGOs are very concerned about particular projects which are implemented through the RF, where they think that the do no significant harm requirements are not respected, what we usually do is uh, we, we, we take this information, we confront the national authorities so that they also obviously have a chance to express themselves. And, and then uh, if need be, I mean, um, uh, and, and there's a problem, then indeed, I mean, we will go on, this, on the ground and check ourselves. And then obviously, I mean, if, if there's a problem, I mean, this will have to be corrected. Um, uh, um, in order to ensure that uh, no such uh, uh, behavior is supported by the RF. So, so again, transparency is super important because otherwise, um, because it's an important source also for us to make sure that indeed in the practical implementation, those who know best because they are closest uh, to the investment projects that they basically make themselves heard and also get back to us so that we can indeed look into these questions and ensure that also in the practical implementation these requirements are complied with. And I think I stop here as a matter of introduction and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks so Mr. Van uh, for this uh, comprehensive overview. I think you met, uh, you mentioned the regional um, involvement and also the transparency quite extensively. So let's go uh, for the direction of transparency first, Mrs. hirsch Timbenska. Do you actually uh, you know, agree with the uh, assessment of Mr. Van Beska in terms of uh, what can be done, what is done, and uh, what's your ideas of what can be done more. And obviously, feel free to, to connect this again um, with your introductory remarks. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, on my side now as well for the invitation, for the invitation of the Caribbean Ombudsman to join this interesting discussion. And indeed, I was very happy to hear um, the representative of the European Commission that transparency is important for the Commission. We know that, but uh, we have to look uh, for the ways how to make this working. And here I would like to, to say a few words about the European Ombudsman work um, in this direction. So um, first, of course, we, we are all aware, because I think we should never forget this, that at the recent European, or European Barometer Opinion Poll, almost 40% of Europeans think that this instrument, RRF, uh, will not be effective. There is therefore a major challenge to explain why the European Union is doing this, how and what it entails. And the, the unique features of the facility, as we all know, kind of challenges for European Union, national, regional, public administration, and we, the European Ombudsman, we are helping to ensure the transparency, accountability in the implementation of the facility at the European Union level. Uh, and now our national colleagues, national Ombudsman, regional Ombudsman, may do the same at the national level. And here at the Ombudsman office, we observed two main challenges concerning the, the facility. The first one relates to the transparency of the negotiations the Commission held with the member states leading to the adoption of national plans. And we, the Ombudsman has received several complaints from investigative journalists in Germany, France, Sweden, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And they also submitted requests for access to documents to the Commission concerning the exchanges that took place between their national authorities and the Commission when uh, at the stage of drafting and evaluating the national recovery resilience plans. Uh, the Commission, in reply, identified the large list of documents, I remember about 100 for each request, which were falling under these requests. Um, there was obviously uh, extensive interaction between national governments and the Commission during the drafting process. Um, the documents, with, there were correspondence with national authorities and the Commission, minutes of meetings, documents assessing the national plans, 
that they were first submitted. Uh, but the Commission granted access only to some of the documents and refused full or partial access to others. And the journalists came to us with a complaint. And this case is clearly illustrate why it is so important uh, that public administrations provide as much information as possible proactively. So the citizens do not need to submit requests for access to documents that are of, of, of public interest. And when, we come, when it comes to the recovery and uh, national recovery resilience plans, the public is interested in knowing how the negotiations um, go are between member states and the commission proceeded. And of course, if and how these negotiations may have been influenced by certain interests uh, such as lobby groups. We are in now at the stage of inspecting some of the documents to which access was denied, and then the Ombudsman will decide about the next step in the investigations. The second challenge we observed concerns the mechanism set in place for the transparency accountability of the facility itself. This was also mentioned by the colleague from the Commission. The facility is subject to communication information requirements. And like I'd say, in any other expense in which the European Union participates, the public needs to know how the money is being used. However, the RRF information requirements are not so clear cut as those that apply to other funds, like agricultural or cohesion funds, and investigate quite a lot, a lot the, the, the complaints related to these funds. And in these other funds, there were rules clearly obliged, obliging member states to publish detailed data about the final beneficiaries of the funding. The LRF regulation requires member states to collect data on final recipients of funds and make this available upon request. They are not required to publish, um, they are not required to publish this information proactively. So I'll, once again, I underline the word proactively. Moreover, the public should be reassured that member states comply with the conditions attached to the loans and grants. It is not yet clear what information we publish it concerning how the money is spent or how these expenditures will be monitored by the administration. And the European Ombudsman wrote to the European Commission, I think in March this year, uh, asking the Commission to clarify how these schemes will be applied in practice. We should receive the reply of the Commission, I believe, um, still this week. And in parallel to this ongoing inquiries and strategic initiatives, the Ombudsman is developing something interesting, I would say, together with OECD, namely good practice principles for government transparency in the use of recovery funds. And these good practices principles uh, will provide guidance to public administrations on how to ensure the transparency of the funds. Um, in the guidance, uh, we emphasize aspects which are unfortunately very frequently overlooked by administration, but which are crucial for uh, to hold them accountable, namely dissemination of easy to understand information using a range of channels like social media or advertising involving so civil society in the implementation and evaluation of the project. And also, last but not least, that there is a complaints mechanism so that the public can draw attention to any irregularity they observe. And just to conclude this um, short introduction to our work concerning ERAF, um, of course, we acknowledge the difficulties that the European Union National Administration is facing in designing and implementing rules for the facility. And uh, this is why we aim at providing an orientation to public administrations that should be taken into account in design of practices. And all of that is for, with one objective, very clear, to generate trust, trust in public spending at this crucial moment in which the implementation of the funding is still uh, taking shape. Thank you very much. And I will be happy to, to, to reply to questions. Thank you very much um, for the intervention on, on the transparency. I have so many follow-up questions, but I will uh, not, not ask them now and pass on the floor to Mr. Cassianos Morel. And maybe you can explain a bit how you perceived all of this from a regional perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, first of all, to, to the Greens and the European Free Alliance uh, group at the European Parliament for the invitation uh, on behalf of the, of the Catalan government. Uh, for the invitation to, to a very convenient event, I think, uh, which is uh, now that we, we already have some experience on the implementation of uh, RRF, uh, and not, we are not uh, in, the, in the planning stage, but in the planning stage, 
to do a first evaluation, uh, it's very, very, very convenient. Uh, I will focus my assessment, my quick assessment, uh, in three subjects related to, to this implementation that I think are relevant to, to us, which is, first of all, if we are somehow perceiving some kind of incentive effect of the RRF funds. Secondly, whether we are adapting properly our public management tools in order to uh, deploy all these uh, auxiliary funds uh, in a very short period of time. And third, uh, if uh, we think that we are applying the subsidiary principles that uh, we think that we have to be applied uh, on the implementation of these RRF funds. Uh, my point of view uh, clearly is, is very partial, but I want to, to point it out. Partial because we are in, a, in the first year of implementation, so uh, it's a preliminary assessment. And second, uh, because it's a regional perspective, you know? uh, it's a perspective of a region that wants to take advantage of uh, these next generation funds in order to reindustrialize our economy and to accelerate this green and digital transition. First of all, the incentive effect. Uh, we already know that the recovery and resilience plan uh, would likely act as a catalyst of attracting private investment, mainly in the two drivers that we want to focus uh, this investment, which is digitalization and uh, acceleration of the green uh, transition. And uh, if we focus on, uh, uh, I would like to share two figures that are pretty relevant in order to uh, know whether this is actually happening or not. No? The first figure, uh, we are in an historic high of uh, foreign investments project portfolio in Catalonia that want to invest uh, in Catalonia, mainly uh, in these uh, two areas, in uh, circular uh, economy models and digital uh, business. Uh, we never had so many potential projects in Catalonia are willing to invest uh, here. So this is showing uh, somehow that the next generation funds are uh, a driver uh, to foreign investment. So this incentive effect is actually occurring. No? We have more than 600 investment projects nowadays, which is a figure that we never had before. And uh, additionally, we have to mention that 2021, which was the first years of implementation of next generation funds, uh, we had uh, more investment projects materialized than ever in Catalonia. So uh, obviously, as I said, uh, this will require a further analysis, but it seems that the funds are already leveraging and encouraging private investment in the Catalan region. Uh, at least, you know, and I think it's a pattern that is common in other European regions. The second, the second subject I wanted to focus, uh, the, uh, whether we are adjusting properly the public management funds, you know, if we are simplifying the procedures in order to, to get uh, or to guarantee that these funds are available for most of our companies, which basically are small and medium companies that uh, they don't have the time sometimes or the resources in order to apply to the, the goals that we are publishing uh, the different public uh, administrations. On this regard, I would say that uh, there are many efforts from the public administrations, mainly uh, regional uh, and local administrations so that trying to simplify to make the life easier to these SMEs that want to take advantage of these funds, for example, from Catalonia, we created last year, at the end of last year, uh, a next generation uh, EU office in order to act as a gateway and a facilitator to boost SME access to this fund. And we know that these initiatives uh, has been, uh, have been presented in many other regions, in many other administrations in order uh, to bring closer uh, the RRF, uh, the RRF funds to SMEs that at the end are the, the base of not only the Catalan economy, but the European uh, economy itself. No? We have to point out that the results are not very, not very promising. No? We don't have results uh, in terms of the participation of SMEs, but uh, we can <clears throat> mention some recent surveys at the Spanish level 
that are not uh, very exciting on this regard. Eh? Uh, 65% of the uh, companies in Spain uh, are saying that they will be not able to participate as a potential recipient of RRF funds. Uh, this, this data obviously is a provisional data, is in a, is a survey, so it has the, uh, I mean, we cannot reach final conclusions, but at least uh, it should be uh, a figure uh, to, to, to change at least or, or to, to focus the efforts in the two next years of implementation. No? Um, so we are trying to facilitate the things for SMEs, but uh, we are not uh, we are not uh, managing that the, the SMEs. Uh, I mean, uh, think that RRF is really an opportunity for them. No? Why is that? Uh, basically, it's because uh, we require a cultural change, a cultural change in the in the administration, that it goes behind the public uh, management tools. And uh, let me share uh, with uh, with you a consideration that addressed to me uh, the director of one of the agencies that is successfully deploying nowadays uh, around 3,000 million euros for SMEs digitalization. So uh, uh, what, what, what he was saying, this, this director was saying to me that um, uh, we were in, in a, some kind of paradox no? because we are trying to deploy extraordinary funds, you know, to accelerate uh, in this case, the digitalization of SMEs, but we are facing a legal framework, and I think this not only in Spain, a legal framework that was designed 10 years ago that basically had other objective, opposite objectives than the ones that we have right now. You know? Which was its objective? Basically, 10 years ago, the objective of many regulations managing public funds was to contend the public expenditure. That is not the case nowadays. Uh, we have uh, the opposite objective, no? uh, I mean, to accelerate uh, the deploying of public funds. So if we want really uh, to change its perception and to simplify the management of RRF funds, I think that we need uh, really uh, a structural change and a structural change that I think that uh, must be led uh, by the European Commission in order to be uh, effective. And third and last, no, uh, are we really applying the principles of subsidiarity? Uh, well, uh, we don't think so. In this case, we have to speak about the lesson which is not learned according to our criteria. Uh, actually, a study will be presented in a couple of hours in the Catalan delegation in Brussels, which is a benchmark on the implementation of next generation funds in 17 European regions of nine member states. And I can already advance you the main conclusion. Uh, I don't want to make a spoiler, but the main conclusion is that the multi-level governments and subsidiarity principles have not been respected in the implementation of RRF. Uh, this is creating uh, several distortions that I think that I don't have time to mention right now. And then hopefully we have some extra minutes uh, I will address and share with you later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for, for this for this interesting uh, perspective. I agree with the structural change need. Uh, so um, let's discuss further. I would now uh, give the floor to Alexander. I don't know if you would like to ask a question to any of the uh, participants um, regarding any of the topics mentioned. Yes, thank you very much, Damian, and good afternoon to everybody. Thanks for, for joining us um, on, on this, this panel on the RF. I have a question that is unsurprisingly um, related to what was my specific field of activity in terms of RF and to the panel that I will be moderating. Um, the parliament fought for a gender equality priority in the RF regulation and for gender impact assessments because um, it was quite evident and that was also recognized by the regulation that women were particularly hard hit by the COVID-19 recession. Um, while at the same time, um, the, large, the majority of the investment goes into, in terms of employment, very strongly male dominated sectors like, like energy, like transport, like buildings, for the green priority, and rightly so, speaking as a green politician and in digital, and I also support that as somebody specializing in digital. Um, 
so the parliament asked for a gender equality priority and for specific gender impact assessments, because we also know that if we want growth, um, we do need to boost women's employment, especially in countries like, for example, Italy, the main beneficiary, where the women's female labor participation is extremely low. And the Bank of Italy, for example, uh, and also the OECD recommend increasing women's participation in the labor market in order to achieve growth and especially sustainable growth. Um, so with my, my question goes to, to Eric von Breska with, with hindsight now, and I will in my panel uh, two gender impact assessments on the Italian and on the Spanish plan and some reflections on how this turned out in Germany will be presented that will basically say that um, according, I mean, the different ways of measuring this, but more or less 80% of the investment will go to men and only 20% to women. Do you think if the EU uh, came up with another package, we know there's a huge investment gap in terms of green investment, there might be things like the RF in the future, um, we should consider gender more as a priority, also considering that global economy is moving towards these sectors, towards the green transition, renewable energy, digital, this is where the investments are flowing, this is where employment is being created. And if women are basically excluded from this growing sectors as it happens now, not, not because anybody is excluding them on purpose, but for structural reasons, um, we will probably see an even wider gap also in terms of social cohesion because women not having adequate incomes um, will mean more child poverty, will mean more poverty in older age. These are all typically uh, female phenomena. So if there was another big investment, do you think that gender should be a priority and that we should have specific instruments to make sure that funding goes in equal measure to all members of our society and all our citizens? Thank you. Perfect. Since our time is uh, limited, I would instantly also ask Rosa D'Amato if you want to add your question to Alexandra's and then um, we can have a quick answer round. Sì, grazie, grazie Damian. We'll speak in Italian, so please switch to Italian language. Italian language uh, Italian uh, translation is uh, if you uh, go to, to the, go the to um, settings and then it says language translations and or interpretation, and then you can change it. Yeah. Go ahead, Rosa. Okay, my question is, since we know that the legal basis for the RRF regulation is the same used for the cohesion policy, what we're discussing at the Regional Development Committee is that there needs to be an intention to abandon the methodology of the European Structural Funds to rely more on a RRF uh, type of funding, and we see this already in the Repower EU. Uh, do you think that is possible? My second question is, uh, how is the Commission going to assess the quality, the quality of the projects uh, in order to make sure that their social and economic impact is long lasting in the various regions? Because we are noticing on top of the issues that Alessandra has mentioned is that uh, there is a, a very uh, high number of uh, retrospective projects uh, uh, that had already been uh, funded with national funds and that are now being uh, uh, moved uh, to uh, the uh, PNRR, that is the National Recovery and Resilience uh, Funds. Uh, how will we know whether this uh, uh, re re RRF will really promote the economy and uh, favor the cohesion uh, in Italy and Europe as a whole? I'll add a mini question from Mr. Sirsch in Zimbinska, which is um, when do we uh, expect or when can we expect your report um, uh, from the Ombuds office? I think it would be very interesting to, to dive further into this. Um, and then with this, I, I see also maybe Ernest, would you like to um, add a question? 
uh, two, two brief questions. Um, one of the things that um, that um, um, we we find in several member states is that the in the implementation of the RRF uh, there is a, a, a huge asymmetry of information between different companies and SMEs. Uh, I think that Mr. Castellanos explained very well how the Catalan government is trying to avoid that by having a, a one shop for all the participants where they can find all the information because they, this is really a problem. Uh, and I would like to know if we have other positive experiences in other member states on how uh, to make sure uh, that every single company uh, or, 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 or person who would like to engage in a project can have the information uh, and do so. So this is my first question. And the second question, which is really worrying, maybe uh, that this is more for Mr. Bomberesca, but may maybe also for Mr. Castellano. How is it inflation affecting the development of projects? Do we really have a problem with the tenders, uh, with uh, uh, our... Um, are the projects being uh, uh, being forced to being rewritten uh, because of the changing on the prices? Um, and, and how is the, um, uh, the Commission addressing that problem, which is, uh, I think, uh, uh, really a concern for many for many member states? Voila, those are more two questions. Thank you. Perfect. Maybe we can uh, do the tour in return. So we start with Mr. Mr. Castellanos and Manuel. And we don't have a lot of time. No, it's, it's, it's actually affecting a lot the inflation to, to the, the public tenders. Uh, and basically, it's affecting all the sectors of the economy, but mainly the ones that uh, are more energy intensive. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, they are participating in tenders because they, they, they arrange the prices that then uh, they are not adjusted. To the, the the cost that they're increasing a lot so this is a problem uh the spanish regulation the Catalan regulation uh mainly focused on being able to adjust this this uh, the price of these standards to the increase of the cost only in the construction sector but we need we urgently need a broader perspective that was uh, very concise <laughs> thanks for that um do we, would you like to answer any of the other um, questions, or is this uh, is this fine? Well, I think that I think that is the only question that was addressed Perfect. to me. So, since we are running out of time, I will leave the others to, to answer the other questions. That's very kind of you, Mr. And then I would go to Mrs. Hirsch Zimbinska. Thank you, uh, Damien. So to your question about when the Ombudsman will be ready, so I think we we, we are hoping, and I think. Everything indicates we will do this. We will be able to publish the, the report to the, of OECD, so good practice principles, um, mid July, so before the summer break, which um, I think uh, it would be a good timing. As regards other uh, investigations, I mean, hard to say, but um, the investigation concerning dual complaints, as I said, we will inspect documents. Uh, we are doing that already. So um, once we inspect documents, we can very quickly um, make suggestions to the Commission. And then uh, we will see what is the reply, or maybe we'll be able to close already immediately or do recommendations. I don't know, depends uh, on, on, on the result. And finally, the Ombudsman Strategic Initiative concerning the Commission, I said we should receive the reply from the Commission this week. So I hope as well that it will be very quick and as far as possible, we'll try to close everything before, um, before the summer. So this is as regards the dates, you know, we will be as quick as we can, but with OECD, we agree that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, Mr. Van Beska, um, not only from you know my colleagues, uh, but also from actually your co-panelists, there were a couple of <laughs> points in, in your direction. I think that comes probably uh, with proposing such an ambitious proposal and then having to implement it. Obviously, there's interests from all direction, and um, also because the the amounts that we talk about are not just like yeah. uh, small. <laughs> so, I guess uh, the that's the reason. So um, feel free to, to elaborate on the, the questions that you have. Um, I mean, uh, yes, I, I have a very interesting question from Alessandra and also Rosa, of course. Um, gender equality, when I hear that, I think immediately about the charter of ah. and compliance with the charter. This should be done in whatever um, the union does or uh, the member states does when are in the acting in the field of European law. And this is the case. So I, I will underline here what I mentioned, the complaints mechanism, because in, back in 2018, we investigated the SE uh, requirements to have complaints mechanism in each member states. Uh, and this was a very revealing investigation because we had also national ombudsman joining us. 
And uh, I think from the almost one conclusion from that time, what we will say is, of course, if something is wrong, because complaints are always reactive, but then we could improve for the future and we could resolve issues. So this is very much for public, for citizens to, to, to have access to these complaints mechanisms. If they are aware of wrongdoings, they should have been able, they should be able to react and their action should be taken to account according to proper um, procedures. So this is why we ombudsman, we always uh, underlining this monitoring, yes, overseeing, yes, but there should be mechanisms which is easily accessible to everybody, persons who also including persons with disabilities. Um, so this is what I would say about the other issues. As a moderator, you're always uh, nervous, so I, I'm sorry, I jumped in already too early, yeah. um, Mr. But then now, uh, without further ado, to uh, Mr. Van Baska to answer some of the questions as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I will try to be brief, but these are quite a, a number of questions. I, I start with uh, the question of access to documents. I, and I want to reassure all of you that we take this very, very seriously. Uh, and we try to make uh, as much information as possible, uh, available as possible. Having said this, I mean, in these negotiations, and I give you just one concrete example, uh, when we were negotiating the plans with the member states, they need to provide us with cost estimates. I mean, how much does a certain investment cost? And for example, in many member states, in fact, I mean, uh, they used um, information which they received from companies which obviously is super sensitive because this is uh, uh, economic sensitive uh, information and, uh, and, and which we requested in order to be sure that you know, like what we were supposed to pay indeed reflects the cost of the investment, but which we clearly cannot make available because it would obviously put um, the, 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 the enterprises which had pro provided this information into uh, a very difficult situation. So, so there are some limitations to uh, the type of uh, information which we can make available. Having said that, um, again, um, and I, I guess that you noticed, know Damien, but also uh, the other members of the European in Parliament, uh, we make every single assessment of the plan, but also of each milestones and target in a payment request immediately available, not only to the European Parliament uh, in real time, but, but also make it available on our website. So you will see, for example, for the payment requests, which we have approved uh, for Spain, Italy and others. So you can check for each and every milestone, how we have assessed the milestone, why we think it was satisfactory fulfilled and so on. So you will find um, our whole assessment there uh, because we want to be as transparent as possible. Um, having said that, I admit that it, this discussion is much harder with the member states because many member states consider this, I mean, the administrations uh, as kind of an administrative burden, you know, like to make publicity, to communicate to the public and so on. And, and it's always kind of trying to push them uh, in order to follow up on their obligations because these are obligations uh, which are set out in the financing agreement. Uh, but but I will not hide from you that this is always uh, quite a, a battle or so to, to get them where I think we, we all want them to be. So I think that uh, just on the first uh, issue, I then jump um, to, 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 um, to um, some other questions, maybe on inflation, because this is clearly one of the big topics. Um, uh, the Commission, in its repower proposal, we have also established, uh, we have not only in the, in the legal text, but also in the accompanying guidance made very clear that um, this is a problem uh, and, and we are very uh, uh, open to discuss with the member states uh, um, uh, a revision of their plans to adjust them in order to take into account the new situation. And, and indeed, there are two problems. The first one is simply uh, the one that uh, companies do not participate in call for tender because they simply do not know whether the price which they basically offering right now is still um, doable or implementable in a year from now if they have to engage themselves in a multi-year investment project. So you have situations where there are simply no companies participating, participating in call for tenders. Um, you have other situations where indeed the call for tender is much, much, the price is much, much higher than initially uh, envisaged. But all of this obviously puts in question the commitment of the member state to uh, deliver on the targets uh, it has agreed with us. And so we expect right now a revision of, of many plans um, to take into account the new inflation uh, uh, prospects. So I think that is uh, the situation on inflation. On gender equality, um, let me just say, I, yes, I think if we were to do it again, probably we would need to uh, look a bit differently at, uh, at, at such an instrument. 
Having said that, I think first we need to be aware that this was a crisis situation and something had to be done very, very quickly. And, uh, and, and this was the best which could be done at that point in time. And second, I mean, when you look at the plans which were adopted by the Commission, you will see um, that um, many of them, in fact, uh, have measures which address the question of gender equality. So, for example, you have access to finance uh, for female enterprises. Uh, you, in, in many plans, you have, for example, the reduction of pension uh, gender gaps or so, which are uh, enshrined, in, in for example, in the Austrian plan. You have um, the support to participation of women in labor markets. Um, so you have quite a number. I think we have more than 120 measures across plans which address this issue, and we will also report on this. Speaking of report, uh, we are going to um, publish end of July our review report, where we will uh, share with you uh, what is the latest state of play, and there will be a dedicated chapter also on gender equality and how this is being addressed in the context of DRF with the latest figures and the latest uh, uh, um, situation in terms of projects to be implemented. Um, this brings me to probably my last uh, comment on the question um, uh, uh, how we are addressing regional disparities uh, and cohesion. Um, I would make a difference because the structural funds are clearly a regional based uh, instrument, because in, if I take, for example, Italy, all the regions have their own programs, uh, while the RF is a national based instrument. So um, uh, clearly, uh, it is a bit different from, from uh, the approach of the structural funds. Having said that, we have many measures in uh, the plans, which, for example, are very relevant to address regional disparities, like social housing, like support to rural uh, areas, like infrastructure uh, investments and, and, and services of, of common interest, uh, uh, which are supported. So there are quite a number of measures uh, in, 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 in the different plans. And in particular in Italy, uh, there is a commitment from the Italian government that 40% of the overall investment in the Italian plan are supported are supposed to support the southern part of Italy. So there's a very strong um, uh, um, the regional dimension in the Italian plan, uh, which is different than what you find under the structural funds, but we still assume that it will have quite a significant impact on territorial cohesion uh, in Italy and also across many member states. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Perfect. Then um, I will ask one last question um, to Mr. Castellanos, just because uh, you had uh, such a short reply only. And that is, you talked about uh, certain findings on subsidiarity that you are looking into. And we were just wondering, um, do you have any results that you could share with us on this, um, either also in writing and maybe just quickly summarizing what you what you've looked at there? Yep, thank you very much. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I mean, we have this study that is going to be presented in uh, in a couple of hours, but uh, mainly we are worried for the lack of subsidiarity, uh, basically because we think that it's generating a, a double efficiency distortion, let's say. First of all, I think that this, this lack of subsidiarity is, is a serious threat uh, for negative discrimination of more industrialized regions uh, because uh, basically it can affect the, the regional assignment of the funds. First of all, uh, nowadays, uh, well, we account for uh, almost 20% of the Spanish economy and uh, the territorial funds of the RRF uh, uh, accounts for 14% of the total funds in Spain. So uh, this is worrying uh, us quite a lot. But then, because uh, we, we think that it, it could introduce uh, this lack of subsidiarity, a significant bias on private investment decisions. I mean, nowadays, uh, I, I'm sure that you are aware of that. Um, next generation funds is a variable that is taken take into account for the private investors in order to decide where to settle uh, their productive plans. And this is a thing that is affecting some decisions nowadays. Uh, so it's a thing that uh, is worrying us quite a lot. Uh, 
or what we have seen is common in other European regions. And it's a study that we will be presenting today, this afternoon. And well, it's a thing that it needs to be adjusted in the following years. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to all the panelists. This was super interesting. I took a lot of notes and I I have a lot of follow-up questions on the, on the facts of inflation and, and the, the questions of gender on the questions of subsidiarity and all the other topics on transparency that we have touched upon. It's always, uh, you know, you need an hour for each of them. Um, so uh, thanks a lot for packing the agenda so tightly with all your with all your thoughts. Uh, I think it was, it was super helpful and insightful for me. So with this, I would hand over to Jordi, who will um, take it from here. And I uh, thank you very much for your, for your time in this first panel. You know, busy to my colleagues as well. Bye bye. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Damien, and, and thanks uh, to all the panelists uh, uh, from this first uh, discussion. It's been very interesting. Um, now, for uh, the next uh, couple of minutes, because we are a bit uh, late uh, according to our schedule, um, we are going to uh, discuss. Um, another very important issue related to the implementation of the RRF, which is um, green spending and the implementation of the do no significant harm principle. Um, my name is uh, Jody Sule. I am member of the European Parliament, uh, member of the Greens European Free Alliance uh, group, and I am also a member in the working group um, uh, who is uh, following the implementation of the of the RRF, um, we as a group we have always seen uh, the RRF as a as a good good opportunity and a good instrument uh, for member states to accelerate uh, their green uh, transition and thus uh, advancing towards the 2030 and 2050 uh, targets. As we know, at least 37 uh, percent of the funds must be for climate action and no uh, investment uh, funded by RRF um, should harm uh, the environment. We also know that uh, the overall uh, climate expenditure of all approved uh, national uh, plans reaches almost uh, 220 billion euros, which is a, a very significant uh, um, sum. Uh, of money, but uh, we are going to ask um, ourselves and, and I'm going to ask uh, our panelists for this second discussion, uh, where are we today in terms of uh, green uh, spending? Are member states doing uh, enough when it comes uh, to uh, implementing investments uh, which are green. Is the Commission uh, watching uh, correctly over the do no significant harm principle? Is this a uh, requirement being uh, really enforced? Uh, so these are um, questions that are very important uh, to us and very important to the implementation, to the correct implementation of the um, RRF. Um, I will very briefly now introduce our uh, wonderful uh, speakers. Uh, we have uh, with us um, Anelia Stefanova. She is a, pro a program director of uh, Bankwatch and also represents uh, Bankwatch in Green 10, which is a coalition of leading environmental NGOs working in, in Brussels. After joining uh, Bankwatch in 2000, in year 2000, as Bulgarian national coordinator, a coordinator she has also, also coordinated the NGO's uh, transport campaigns and later the policy work on the European Investment Bank, uh, EU funds, transport and, and climate. So welcome, Anelia, and thanks for being uh, with us this afternoon. And uh, we also have with us uh, Elena Jerebitza, sorry if I'm spelling it uh, maybe not 100% correct. Um, Elena is senior researcher and campaigner at Recommon. She is part of the energy and infrastructure team of Recommon, and she has been looking into RRF funding of energy and infrastructure uh, projects, particularly um, in, in Italy. In Italy, I have to say that we don't we do not have a third speaker 
um, from from Greece, from a local Greek NGO, as it was uh, planned um, at the beginning. But uh, we have um, two wonderful panelists, and I'm sure she will explain us uh, very interesting things concerning uh, green spending in the in the RRF. As I said, we are running a bit uh, a bit late, so. Um, uh, please make your uh, speeches uh, uh, be around uh, seven, eight minutes. And I'm afraid we won't have uh, time for uh, further discussions or, or further questions. Um, but yeah, this is how this is how it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about this. Um, without uh, further delay, um, Anelia, we, st we start uh, we start with with you, uh, and I pass you the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope you hear me well, um, and the connection is good enough because I'm uh, in the fact-finding mission in Bulgaria related to the just transition and uh, speaking from, from a regional hub here. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. I wanted just to briefly say that Central and East Europe Bank Watch Network is a network of environmental grassroots uh, watchdog organizations uh, working across Central and East Europe. And together with Euronatur, um, our partner, uh, we, were, we started monitoring of the uh, recovery funds uh, already beginning of 20, um, end of 2020, beginning of 2021, with systematic analysis about the uh, uh, recovery and resilience plans in nine Central and East European countries. Um, uh, my focus will be do no significant harm principle, and I want to highlight that uh, for us, it's really it was important step forward. First of all, to see introduction of this principle, which is definitely uh, which is one step behind, be, uh, one step uh, up, um, ahead with uh, what is current legislation requiring. Uh, because in principle, this uh, this is for us going beyond the prevention, which is precautionary principle, which is in the EU legislation, and requires that there is no trade off. And there's no trade off between different priorities of the European objectives. Um, uh, but the, 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 um, we see that this principle is currently also under attack, and uh, we want to see rather strengthening the principle instead of being, I mean, abolished or put aside for some moment because of the emergency and the new crisis situation. Uh, therefore, we, we look very carefully and also had a lot of discussions with our colleagues working on environmental topics about how we could further strengthen the do not significant harm principle. Um, and uh, my presentation would focus exactly on, on, on that. I mean, what are the main challenges? Um, so the what we observe in the last year in the implementation of do not significant harm principle is that uh, the first big challenge for the, for the principle is the fact that we have is the scale of the recovery fund and the type of investments which normally are proposed. Uh, the biggest part of the, the plans was very much for us business as usual approach. I mean, most of the, the projects was large infrastructure projects, which uh, are normally were typically financed before by the, by the EU funds. Sorry. Um, and uh, this was the reason why obviously you would have a lot of harmful impact expected from such projects. Um, and uh, there was very little thinking at what, what will be the new challenges we need to face with the, with the crisis and what kind of resilient measures we need to propose in longer. Term. Most of the plants had um, some green investments, but let's say not really transformative and really long-term thinking investments. So a lot of work initially was to, uh, to try to, and so, thanks also to the help of the Greens, to clean the plants from the harmful measures. And fortunately, some of the most harmful was, 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 was taken off from the commission um, based on the commission suggestions, but still, I mean, we have a lot of uh, gray areas to be uh, improved. The second uh, big concern is about how the do not significant harm was conducted. Most of the time, there was no experts or rather there was a, just an official in the, in the ministry which will be just ticking the box or even uh, have a conflict of interest because there are people proposing projects and they are the one which would say, are they in line or we do no significant harm principle? Obviously they would say it's in line and it's, it was very, autumn, it is one of the things which we say, we saw in most of the, the programs, copy and paste, it's in line, it's in line and because uh, without specific explanation. Many often commission asked for those, but uh, 
not all the cases you see the explanation coming back from the government and because of the hurry some of the plans was approved without proper assessment of do not think and harm principle last thing um, the is the the lack of transparency and misleading information often this type of information which is supposed to be public information uh, because it's part of its environmental information in most of the cases was not there. I mean, it was it was very difficult to obtain uh, the information about the assessment of the do not seek and harm. So obviously, we as a watchdog organization or other type of actors, sorry for that again, um, are very um, uh, were had a difficulty to make uh, their parallel assessment and make a, make their comments to the commission, to the government. But what is wrong? What is wrong with the certain type of proposals? Um, and of, uh, very often, unfortunately, we also see that sometimes the do not significant harm kind of assessment was used as a substitute of the legally binding requirements like environmental impact assessment or strategic impact assessment, because the, they were just saying, okay, we did that what commission asked us, so why we should, should not go ahead with the project without carrying out properly the legal assessment, which is necessary in this case. So uh, that, that therefore also many, many environmental groups was also concerned about that, uh, that do not significant harm principle is said to be something which is advancing the, the implementation and uh, preventing harm is basically uh, degrading der uh, or derogating from the current environmental legislation requirements and or used to about that. Um, recently, we published a report. It, it came two weeks ago uh, with the first, uh, with the with another set of case studies, which we analyzed across nine uh, Central European countries. And I would like to zoom in a bit more about the do not significant harm implementation in the in relation to biodiversity, because there are different aspects of that. But we were particularly concerned about the fact that. Uh, often we would see the conflict or like um, contraposition between the, the climate measures and biodiversity measures, while it should be completely opposite. We see that climate and biodiversity uh, protection are part of the uh, they are part of the same uh, issue and the same and the same type of crisis measures which we need to address with the comprehensive solutions. Um, so our report uh, look at the fact that first of all there were almost no investment in the biodiversity. We have less than 1% of the uh, recovery funds used for biodiversity conservation, uh, which also shows the, the lack of long-term thinking of most of the um, governments. Uh, but in the same time, we have set of measures which we, we could see they could be very problematic in terms of um, which could look green in the first hand, like water management measures or desertification measures. But in the same time, um, comparing with past experience, we would see that uh, without proper uh, analysis and conservation measure, um, measures to pre prevent, we would have the negative, possible negative impact in terms of rivers uh, regulations or in terms of uh, uh, water water area uh, yeah the, uh, areas ma management which uh, might have negative impacts on biodiversity a big concern for us is related to the repower europe uh, also was the, the boost or i mean look at the our renewable energy um, as a strategic type of, um, of investment opportunity without considering what could be the harmful impacts of, of uh, like uh, uh, investments in renewable without uh, on all costs. Uh, for example, for that is the um, uh, reforms which is proposed in in, uh, in Latvia, where they are planning mega windmill plants, uh, which is would be in the forest, which basically would mean uh, forest roads construction and um, cutting of the certain part of the of the forest to construct the windmills, without considering uh, possibilities that windmills could be first placed where they are more uh, needed and decentralized and uh, and be also connected with the with yeah with the land which is already degraded. So not necessary prioritizing investments which could be uh, could be harmful for the for the biodiversity, but other way around. I mean, like looking at the options which are. Yeah, no, uh, no harm at first place, and only after um, considering and analyzing projects, which could be eventually having negative impact. Um, and uh, another aspect which we had similar is the Bulgaria, where a lot of windmills are, or solar panel plants are planned, which is very positive from one side, but 
in the same time, it's very much the, 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 uh, the subsidies or proposals are uh, for investments are towards a big investment. I mean, minimum to 258 megawatts, which normally mean big investors uh, making the uh, the big renewable energy renewable energy plants, which might have considerable negative impact. And instead of using the opportunities to invest in energy communities uh, or other type of, uh, of uh, energy consumption, which could be more local. Um, and like consumers. Uh, so mm, these are the, the examples where we looking at, we, we show examples of why do not significant harm principle today is not used well and could be strength, should be strengthened further. Uh, we have four main recommendations in that direction. First of all, the if you are serious about the, the principle, there need to be much more um, capacity building and training of the local authorities what this mean, because most of the, them are completely ignorant to the, to the topic. They need to know better exactly how the assessment should look like and what the what this principle is about. Um, we would welcome very much that commission think about the methodology because this is not existent today. They ask every government to approach the, the, the principle in their own way and propose methodology. Um, and to think also about the independence of assessment because currently this is not part of the, the requirement uh, what we also want to recommend is the level of replication currently it's the principle is applies, applied on programming level which is important to put the benchmark safeguard but the project level sometimes is very important and often in the programs you don't have enough details to assess what will be the um, specific projects which will be uh, which will be funded and how they might impact um, the, 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 the the different components of the resource management or biodiversity or air quality. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we need um, a really the translation of the do not significant harm principle for the project level assessment. Uh, what is most important and what mentioned also before is the transparency and. Uh, possibility for the public to control and supervise how this is implemented. implemented. Uh, we know that regulation was deficient in that and don't require specific monitoring mechanism. We are actively working to promote such mechanisms across all the different member states. And we believe this could be one of the most important way to also to allow the public citizens, SMEs, uh, to be taking part of uh, monitoring how the uh, how the different investment decisions are taken today and propose alternatives. So monitoring mechanisms and full transparency of what is the pipeline this for recovery fund would be crucial also for the do not significant big and half principle. And last but not least, uh, the taxonomy is still in the development. We believe there are a lot of legislation which is not yet approved. So more sectoral approach and suggestions about how um, the principle could be translated in the way not only to prevent but encourage best good practices um, is, is important uh, because currently we see that yeah uh, investment in the energy efficiency in buildings um, might be uh, is considered good you know good or like positive but with if you don't consider the resource use aspect of that or is that investment long-term and resilient one? And uh, this is thing which is not yet, I mean, taken in on board. So we see that principle could be further improved to encourage that it's go, we go or the investors or uh, public entities go beyond what is legally required today to be a long-term approach and uh, and to invest in the future and not in the business as usual. Because as we see now with the Russian crisis, the business as usual is more than dangerous today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anelia, for, for your uh, in intervention and for sharing with us your main concerns regarding uh, the implementation of, uh, of uh, so-called, uh, some of them, green, green investments and uh, do no significant harm uh, principle. And now we are going quickly uh, to Elena. Uh, and my question is the same. What is your assessment uh, one year on uh, of the RRF regarding uh, green uh, spending and the no, no, to no significant harm principle? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So first of all, uh, I introduced my organization. Recommon is a research and campaigning organization based in Rome. 
uh, in Italy, and uh, we are members of the Counterbalance Coalition, and uh, we have uh, a long-term experience in uh, monitoring uh, public financial institutions so like the European Investment Bank, but also the Italian Export Credit um, Agency, such and uh, it, the, the impact of their activities on the environment, climate and um, human rights. We've been also monitoring uh, the European Commission spending in uh, large infrastructure for, uh, for a long time, in particular, uh, mm, uh, like not only like the, the, the expansion of uh, ports, uh, but also uh, all the investments in uh, uh, mega energy projects. So the specifics of uh, this presentation is just uh, to share uh, um, a case that we've been um, looking into a bit more in depth, which is the case of the new breakwater in, um, in Genoa. Uh, this is uh, the uh, largest uh, infrastructure that was financed by the um, uh, Italian government through the Recovery and Resilience Facility. You can move to the next uh, slide, please. Yeah, uh, and uh, it is a part, uh, is, it is one of the um, projects uh, within the extra, extraordinary program of uh, urgent investments in the Italian recovery plans. Uh, and uh, it is also uh, the basis for the restructuring and the reorganization of the entire port of Genoa. So let's say it is the anchor infrastructure uh, for uh, a broader uh, set of uh, investments. Uh, we talk uh, of at least uh, eight uh, interventions. Uh, the only other one that so far received the funding from the um, Italian recovery plan is uh, the widening of the Ponte dei Mille Levante terminal. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Again, yeah. Uh, so um, the total cost of the uh, breakwater construction is about uh, 1.3 billion uh, euros, of which uh, 950 million are um, part of the first uh, phase, which is the one financed by the um, Recovery and Resilience Facility. So the funding that came through are uh, like uh, about 500 million through the uh, complementary fund that was set up by the Italian government, 100 million through the recovery and resilience facility and uh, 300 million through a loan by the European Investment Bank to the Western Ligurian Seaport uh, Authority, which is the proponent of the, of the project. Uh, the widening of the Ponte dei Mille terminal is also um, receiving uh, 30 million funding through the Western Liguria Seaport Authority, uh, uh, again through the recovery and uh, resilience facility. And the, tos the total cost is only 33 million. Um, so in terms of uh, assessing uh, how the do not significant arm uh, principle was, uh, was actually assessed and implemented. Uh, next, yeah. Uh, the, our concerns are, are based on an impro the improper way in which the environmental impact assessment uh, was uh, conducted and also the do not significant harm assessment. Uh, we basically witnessed a salami slicing approach, which is in violation, is in violation of um, the EU principles of uh, strategic assessment, uh, assessment of alternatives, and precaut precautionary approach. Uh, we see what is happening uh, in the port of Genoa as a unitary intervention, which was divided in smaller ones, and this is uh, uh, illegitimate. So the assessment of the infrastructure uh, that, that was carried out so far is also illegitimate in our, in our view. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, due to the, to the simplification and the fast tracking of uh, projects that are part of the um, recovery and resilience financing, the project was authorized in a record time on May 26th, so just about a month ago. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the Genoa Breakwater, again, uh, is one of the 10 priority infrastructure projects uh, that benefit from this uh, 
accelerated approval procedure under the decree law 77 of 2021, but it is also benefiting from an other fast tracking connected to uh, an investment plan uh, oriented to um, the city of Genoa, which was decided by the government after the uh, collapse of the um, Morandi uh, bridge. Um, so uh, the activities uh, uh, have been only assessed uh, individually. There hasn't been a cumulative uh, assessment of the impacts. And this is uh, um, visible in particular, uh, just one second, uh, um, on, three, on three elements that I would like to go a bit, uh, like just to spend a few words on each one of them. Uh, so the first one is uh, the surrounding marine environment. So the impact on uh, Natura 2000 sites uh, and in particular of uh, an international marine uh, protected area, which is shared by Italy, France and, um, and Monaco. Um, there was no uh, accurate um, evaluation of the impact on the wider ecosystem of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and also uh, the overall impact of the uh, of this entire uh, um, reorganizing of the port uh, underestimated the, the, the impact on the urban development on the city of Genoa and the climate impact of the induced traffic. All the uh, goods that are uh, arriving in Genoa through large uh, vessels uh, are basically transported on the road. So the, the traffic situation is really <laughs> collapsing. Um, one uh, like general point uh, really on the investment as a, as a whole uh, is that the Genoa port expansion is not going to contribute to the mitigation of climate change in any possible way. To the contrary, it will have a significant impact uh, both uh, during the construction of the uh, new uh, breakwater, but also during the operation of the, um, of the expanded port uh, due to the increase of uh, marine traffic. Uh, the expansion is totally aiming to attracting more mega cargo vessels to the port uh, of, uh, of Genoa, which again is impacting the, the Pelagos uh, Sanctuary, this uh, international marine protected area of uh, 80, uh, more than 87,000 uh, square meters. Uh, which is just uh, in front of the, um, of the city of Genoa. And uh, the marine traffic is already, is, is already quite intense uh, in, the, um, in the area and uh, it causes uh, strikes that prove uh, fatal to large cetaceans and are severe enough to threaten the already vulnerable local populations of uh, fin whales and sperm whales. So, um, the failure to take into account uh, the project impact on the on also on the urban development of the of the city and on the Mediterranean ecosystem is already in breach of the uh, environment environmental impact assessment directive requirements to assess the cumulative impacts uh, and the risks uh, inflicting significant harm to the to the marine ecosystem and to the protected species, including by affecting the ecosystem's ability to mitigate climate change. This is a very important point that we tried to flag also in the submission that we shared uh, with you. Um, we uh, discussed this with some senior uh, biologists and they noted that the, the role played by well-functioning marine ecosystems is uh, a determining factor in mitigating climate change. Uh, marine ecosystems more than uh, on land function thanks to the relationship between the biological, the physical and the chemical, chemical components and the alteration of just one of those components can have consequences even at a considerable distance from the site where the alteration uh, occurred. 
so although the Mediterranean is uh, an enclosed sea, it actually functions as a small ocean where there is a rapid turnover of energy as it is transferred by currents and uh, marine organisms from the surface to the deepest depths uh, and vice versa. Uh, so what happens with the construction of the breakwater is that it is going to have a direct impact on two marine canyons that are just uh, in front of the, of the port of, of Genoa. Uh, the assessment was done only on the specific impact related to the construction, but it didn't look to the, to the broader uh, impact on the marine ecosystem. And uh, this is a very um, heavy violation in, uh, in, our, in our view. Uh, moreover, uh, it was not looked in the context of all the, the several uh, infrastructure uh, rebuildings and expansions uh, uh, happening um, in parallel in the port of Genoa. Uh, so again, the cumulative impact is quite uh, clearly not assessed in, um, in this, on this aspect. Uh, the expansion of the port will also excuse lead- Excuse me, excuse me, Elena, I'm terribly sorry to, to, to interrupt you, but uh, we really run out of time and we have to move to the, to the next panel. So uh, if you could please conclude in just uh, two sentences. I'm sorry about this, but we, we have to move on. Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, just in two sentences, uh, uh, the uh, in terms of uh, like uh, the assessment that we could give to the um, to the project is that it is going to cause uh, uh, significant harm on the environment, but it's also going to have a broader impact on uh, on climate change. So it is really going in the opposite direction of uh, any plan for resilience or mitigation um, of uh, of climate change. Uh, however, the um, the fast tracking was clearly a limit, both for inclusion of um, civil society but also for the all different stakeholders uh, to, to, to be involved in a, in a truly, um, in, a, in, a, in a real uh, assessment. Uh, I also second the, um, the general points that were raised by uh, Anelia um, in the presentation just before me, uh, because they are really a good synthesis of all the limits that we also um, encountered in trying to, um, to evaluate this project. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much, uh, Elena and uh, Anelia, for your participation. We don't have time for more. I'm sure we'll, we'd love to discuss further these uh, issues, but uh, it won't be possible uh, today. So I, I just uh, pass the floor now to my uh, to my colleague, uh, Alexandra. She will be chairing the next uh, panel. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your partic participation. Thank you very much, Jordi. I'll take over from here. Um, a very good afternoon from my side as well, and welcome to the panel, the RF and gender equality, where we, we will present independent gender assessments. I would just, since we have 25 minutes, I would just a very, very quick recap. Um, the COVID crisis, the economic part of the COVID crisis has hit women particularly hard in terms of employment, in terms of career advancement, and is particularly also in terms of increasing their unpaid workload in terms of care work. The, uh, the recovery and resilience facility does not address this at all. At the contrary, it is giving public funds for them in their majority to very male dominated sectors. And I already said, I support the digital and the green transition very strongly politically, but we do need accompanying measures to make sure that we have gender equality in our society, that we have social uh, cohesion. And this is even more important since also private investment is flowing into this very male dominated sectors. And in the long term, um, this will increase economic imbalances and that will make women's rights unenforceable because of the economic de dependence, dependency for women that results from this. So, and this is also hampering economic growth that we could have had 
and it is, it is going to have a negative impact on social cohesion. The European Parliament asked for gender impact assessments to make very nuanced analysis of what can be done to offset this and to advance the economy, sustainability, and gender equality in the progress. This was unwanted, wanted by the Commission, uh, struck down by Council in Trilog. So the Green Group, um, who really stands for gender equality, decided to commission independent gender impact assessments for several countries, among them Italy, Spain, Germany, and we, if um, the, the money will ever flow to Poland, we will also do it on the Polish plan. So without further ado, I'm very happy to announce the speakers that will present the independent uh, gender impact assessment. We start with Spain, Lydia Ferre. Lydia Ferre is a lecturer professor at the University of Barcelona, a gender equality and public policy and gender budgeting expert, and she will present her gender impact assessment of the recovery and resilience and transformation plan in Spain. Lydia, you have the floor. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'll try to make it in seven, ten minutes. And uh, so for doing that, I, I will start by saying that the RF uh, for Spain amounts to almost 70 billion to finance 108 investment projects. And those projects are the ones I'm going to assess from or I'm going to assess from a gender perspective. OK, so so the goal or the specific objective of the investment of the Spanish plan are the green transformation, the digital transformation, the social and the territorial cohesion and gender equality. OK, and uh, I think that it's very important to make a gender assessment of the RRF. Basically, because as we all know, the, the, the COVID crisis has been a she session, meaning it has affected more severely uh, economic sectors where women are overrepresented. And because all over the place, we have observed that women have disproportionately uh, supported the burden of the unprecedented increase in household needs. Okay. And therefore, it's urgent to implement measures to restore the employment opportunities of women. Okay, so for the Spanish case, we see an important drop in the employment rate in female dominated sectors such as hospitality, household, retail, and so on. But at the same time, during this period, we also see an increase in the employment rate of other sectors such as information and communication or the energy sector that are highly male dominated. Okay, so, so this is also to show you how large it has been the increase in, in the household uh, burden or the time that women have devoted in particular to childcare and, and domestic chores as a result of, of this crisis. And the main figure is that the gender gap in total hours devoted to paid and unpaid work between women and men is now uh, 15 hours, right? When, bef when bef uh, before the, the crisis was 10 hours, right? So important differences in particular in terms of unpaid work, but also in terms of paid work, okay? So which, which has which will be the impact of these funds on gender equality. Well, I mean, it's true that the Spanish plan has some gender target projects and it has been mentioned before. So some investment projects are devoted to support women's entrepreneurship, attract uh, female talent. There's some funds devoted to digital, digital specific to digital training of women. Uh, to promote scientific and technological vocation at schools, also to pro protect women against gender violence. But in total, gender target projects represent less than 1% of the total RRF, of the total Spanish RRF. Okay? So then, then let's look at what happens with the gender blind projects. Okay, and here I've taken uh, three perspectives and I'm gonna briefly summarize them. I'm gonna start with the input perspective. This is a short-term perspective that looks at uh, the sectors 
uh, that are going to be mainly affected, mainly involved in the implementation. Okay, so the short term labor demand. Uh, in which sectors there's going to be a short-term labor demand, okay? So then to compute how women are going to be affected, what I do is to classify these 108 investment projects across sectors of activities, mainly involved in the implementation of each project, and then reweight the funds allocated to each sector by the share of fees, okay? So following this methodology, I find that only 34% of the Spanish RRF will benefit the employment opportunities of women. And the reason is that a large fraction of the funds is gonna, is gonna be devoted to the green transformation, which means that more efficient buildings are gonna be built, and there's gonna be investment in urban and long distance mobility, decarbonization of the energy sector and so on. But um, the green transformation in the short term will create basically important employment demand in the construction sector, which represents over only an 8%, which only an 8% uh, share of female work. Okay, so this is for the green transformation. But regarding the digital transformation, a similar story. Okay, well, it's true that a lot of investment projects are going to be dedicated to the modernization and the digitalization of sectors that are female dominated, such as healthcare, social service, and so on. Um, the modernization and digitalization of these services are going to require or gonna, are going to increase the labor demand of sectors that are highly male dominated, okay, such as the digital sector. So uh, in this graph, you can see what you can see is that the sectors that receive the larger share of the funds, such as information and communication, are the sectors with a lower representation of females. Okay, so a similar but slightly more positive story uh, results when we analyze the RRF from the output perspective. Okay, so here. What I do is to allocate the funds uh, by sector of activity involved in running the infrastructure or the service, okay? So a longer term perspective. So in this sense, 41% of the Spanish RRF will benefit the employment opportunities of women, okay? And, uh, and here it's true that from the output, output perspective, the RRF will require workers from the educational, the professional, the scientific, and the technical sector, which are more female dominated. But um, uh, so this, the output perspective also identify a lot of other projects that require workers to be run, that require workers from male dominated sectors, right? Such as transport, renewable energy, agriculture, and so on, right? So here again, we see the same graph, but from the output perspective, okay? So the sectors that are gonna receive the larger amount of funds, okay? So electricity, energy, transportation, and so on, are sectors with a very low or a relatively low presence of, of wind, okay? And then the last uh, approach is uh, from, the out, from the outcome perspective. And here what we do is to use the gender equality index to uh, assess what, what's gonna be the impact of these funds in closing the gender gap, okay? So, so this index uh, ranks different domains, okay? Of the Spanish society, health, money, power, work, knowledge, and time according to the degree of gender equality, okay? So the highest the index, the lower the gender gap, okay? So according to this approach, what we see is that seven, uh, only 7% 7 of the RFF has got, are gonna have, of the project, investment projects in the RF, RFF are, are gonna have an impact on, on closing uh, the gender disparity, okay? And um, what is true is that the highest impact is got highest impact is gonna be in time and the knowledge domain that are those domains with more gender inequality, right? So a small percentage of funds, but at least identifying um, uh, uh, um, areas where there is more gender inequality. 
Okay, so let me now conclude by saying that the Spanish arrest does take into account the gender di dimension with some projects that really target at women, but remember that they represent only the 1% of the total, and others that may contribute to reduce gender inequality in important domains such as care service and digital knowledge. But again, in terms of percentage, that's gonna be very a very slow percentage of the total funds, okay? However, given the large component of the funds that it's going to be devoted to the green transformation and the digital transformation, in the short term at least, the funds will mainly benefit the employment opportunities of male workers. Okay? So, so my recommendation is that given that the new economy after the COVID-19 will be basically more skilled, more green, and more digital, with employment growing in sectors such digital health, professional, scientific, technological, educational, and energy, and declining sectors, em declining employment in sectors that are female dominated. Okay, so, so we, we summar I summarized this in this table to see that uh, the, uh, there are important uh, employment growth in sectors that are male dominated, okay? And those are also the sectors that are receiving more funds, okay? And there are declining sectors that are female dominated that are not receiving funds. Then my recommendation is to move women to this, implement policies to move women to these sectors, okay? So we need to increase the participation of women in these growing sectors information and communication, the energy sector, uh, professional, scientific, technological activities, invest a lot of resources in the skill upgrading of in particular unemployed women and those employed in, in declining sectors, and in particular to incentivate the participation of girls in STEM. And this needs to be done at an early stage, meaning primary education. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Ferre. I think these numbers uh, speak for themselves. And this is the Spanish plan, which is considered to be a role model in terms of gender equality for all the national plans. It was very much commended and applauded when it first came out. And we see that less the measures that Eric von, von Breska uh, mentioned before targeted to women are less than 1%. And um, also the rest of the investment is, is very, very far from being equally um, divided. Just one very brief comment in terms of getting girls into STEMs and, and upskilling women and so on. I mean, one, we do know that, that the bucket league in, especially in the IT sector is higher than the pipeline problem. So many, many women who do go into the sector, especially into digital technologies, leave the sector because it has structural problems in not favoring women's careers. Um, there are huge issues of sexism in, in most companies uh, in that sector. So we also have to tackle the structural change and change the companies and not only fix fix the women. I, I'm very skeptical um, about that approach, but um, we have seen, so I think these results are not satisfying. Let's look at Italy. Italy has had a, a quite interesting debate around the recovery and resilience facility and gender equalities. Are the outcomes any better? Dr. Badalassi, you have the floor. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm going through quickly the introduction, introductory part because of many things I, sh I completely share what I already said by Alexandra and uh, Lydia. So uh, I will go through immediately to just the starting point of uh, uh, my presentation, which are two basic uh, uh, context uh, uh, data, which are uh, that Italy will receive the highest share of the EU RRF, 191 0.5 billion since it was the worst country affected by the pandemic in Europe at every level. And this is uh, the, the, the main data, uh, financial data. But as a context uh, data, main context uh, data, I just selected this one, which is despite me being a member of the G7, of the group of the seven, in terms of gender equality, Italy is ranked 14th at EU27 level and the 63rd at global level. So this contradiction is not only a human rights concern, 
but is also a severe limit on economic and social development since the connection between gender equality and uh, GDP has been well proven in literature. So the research that we made for the uh, Italian RRP um, aims to evaluate the gender impact uh, in view of uh, three possible scenarios. Which, is a, uh, which are the possibility that, that uh, this facility may worsen the current gender gap in Italy, rather than it may restore the same gender gap that existed before the pandemic, or rather, and which is our, may our preferred scenario, that the Italian RRP may reduce the gender gap with the real advances on the situation before, that we had before the pandemic. So while trying to outline which might be the best uh, methodology to define uh, this uh, gender impact evaluation, in the end, uh, we had uh, three different methodologies and we compared all of them. Two of them were shared also with uh, the, Spanish, uh, uh, the Spanish research. So the first one is a simply a quote by the Ministry of Finances, Italian Ministry of Finances Gender Impact Evaluation, which reports that the plan, Italian plan, involves activity sectors characterized by a prevalence of male workers for about 79.5% of resources, while sectors in which the share of female employment prevails refer to just over 18% of resources. This is just the first methodology and the first experience that we collected and it was already done by the Italian ministry. This is the second methodology that uh, we used uh, um, and that we could compare with uh, all the three uh, countries that were taken in examination, which is the frame methodology which examined, um, which distributes uh, the resources according to the sector uh, activity sectors that have more or less than 65% of the concentration of men rather than females. And according to this methodology, 86.6% of investments are expected to create or secure employment mainly for men, 3.6% of the investment projects mainly for women, and 8.7% of both for both men and women. So, uh, and this more or less is, uh, goes on the same direction, despite we have different kinds of calculations, but we have more or less the same result. The third methodology, which you already had the first outline in the Spanish plan, is the is inspired to the performance oriented gender budget methodology by Rhonda Sharp, which is used in gender budgeting uh, um, techniques. And uh, um, it offers the, possi the possibility of having a time perspective. So we have uh, in the Italian, um, in Italian plan, we have only 0.2% of gender targeted expenditures, which are expenditures mainly aimed to, 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 to gender problems, gender issues, and so on. And then we have the overall, most of, of, all the, uh, of all the plan, which has been analyzed with a gender mainstreaming approach. What, what is very important to underline is that for the first time, probably, gender mainstreaming principle was so hugely adopted and uh, analyzed and uh, raised so much awareness on this matter. Uh, thanks to the pandemic and the Recovery and Resilience Fund. Uh, with this methodology, we have a time perspective. So we know that in a short term, which corresponds more or less to the time uh, that the, the RRP will finish in 2026, there will be uh, a higher impact on work opportunities for men, 74.3. In the middle term, uh, the, this, uh, the, 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 this impact will be a little bit more softened. Uh, only men will have 60.2% of more opportunities uh, of, of working. And in the, this is the output side, output side, because there will be a sort of balancing and the, the investment infrastructures will enter in, uh, in functioning. So there will be the possibility of having something similar to the situation previous to the pandemic. Then we have the outcome side. That means, uh, well, once we have uh, uh, considered the, the level we started before the pandemic, which will be the spread of gender gap that the Recovery and Resilience Fund will help to recover. So which will only the, the, the small slice of differences that will help to recover. And this slice is a simply 6.8%. So, we also have uh, some uh, des descriptions in details for the different uh, missions, but uh, so I'm sorry, I don't have the time to enter in details on this point, but uh, 
obviously in the middle long term mission for educational research will have the better results in the short term due to the huge amount of resources digitalization and innovation will have a better a small a small better impact on on women but as you can see it's all very uh, very uh, very reduced impact so just the last two slides for conclusions and recommendations so what did we learn on learned on this uh, uh, on this exercise that we had of evaluation despite the lack of gender data and despite of everything we know that all the three methodologies start from different perspectives and obviously calculate the gender gap with different formula and final results but however all of them converge on the same scenario that is it is highly probable that the Italian RRP will be highly unbalanced in the short term, but will help restore somehow the same gender gap as seen before the pandemic, so the same level that we had before. And in the medium long term, in the medium term, and provide improvements only in specific fields connected to areas with a more direct gender impact. So there will be not a, a specific. Uh, structural impact but a specific impact on some fields and some specific areas so there is the concrete risk that the growth of the italian gdp will be underpowered and will not express the full potential due to the gender gap uh, and thus undermining the final achievement of the italian rrp may i underline that the starting point was that the eu rrf was not specifically tailored for a significant or specific achievement in terms of gender equality, but only in terms of framework conditions. There were no specific goals in terms of gender equality. That's why Alexander was talking about the structural impact, uh, unbalanced impact uh, of the RRF. But there are, there are just uh, one, one good news. Uh, some good news is that uh, there are some unexpected, unexpected positive results that. Uh, um, there was more in Italy, this, uh, this plan raised the more awareness of gender inequalities in the public debate and in the, in the Italian public administration institutions, also following the contribution by women's and feminist movements during the negotiation process. So uh, civil society matters, uh, civil movements matters and the female movement, movements matters. So as a result, Italy has adopted a few initiatives aimed at improving gender equality in different fields over the last year, including laws and government initiatives outside of the RRP provisions. So, but oh, despite this positive result, all these initiatives do not appear to have significantly speeded up the process of closing the gender gap so far, not least, this is important because of the counteractive, counteracting negative effects of the forecast recession in autumn so when we achieve something on the one side we lose it on the other so just for a recommendation for uh, for the future so closing the gender gap in italy and in many other eu member states requires huge structural efforts that concentrate policies and investments in the domains where the gender gap is seen the greatest and these are the domains that the EAG already mentions caregiving, work, power, money, time, segregation, stereotypes, violence. Gender gap can't be filled in as a secondary uh, achievement, as an indirect achievement. We need to have a gender equality as a specific goal to have a structural impact on gender equality. So it is highly recommended that the EU's future facilities embed a stronger and more balanced vision on the expected gender impact and accurately define the gender equality targets and allocate considerable funds for this purpose. Gender equality is not only a matter of a final achievement, but it, it's also a matter of the time due to achieve it. Whether we achieve gender equality in 60 years, 10 years, or a century is a matter of gender equality as well. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Badalassian. I apologize for not introducing you adequately. You're an independent research, an economist, an independent researcher and consultant, expect, expert in public policies evaluation, mainly on gender, but should have, I think, two decades. Um, women have more two decades of experience in um, advising, especially public administration on these topics, so a very experienced person. I think the, these numbers speak for themselves. We are spending in Italy almost 200 billion just to restore the, pre the preceding gender gap, which all the economic research says is hampering economic development, economic growth and social cohesion in Italy. So I think we should do better next time. Let's have a look very quickly, we're running out of time at the situation in Germany where we're not going to examine the third gender impact assessment, but I have read it and the numbers are very, very similar um, to, to the ones from Italy and Spain. And we invited for a few comments on the German situation, uh, Dr. Christina Stockfish, very, very warm welcome to you. She's a political advisor on gender equality at the DGB headquarters. The DGB, most people know that, is the Confederation of German Trade Unions that has been watching um, the, the gender equality aspects of the German um, plan for recovery and results very closely. What, what are your comments on the German situation, Dr. Stockfish? You have the floor very, very briefly, maximum four minutes, I think, because we're really running out of time, so sorry. Okay, let's try to be quick. Um, warm welcome to everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, it's the same situation as in Spain and in Italy already stated. Um, many of our recovery packages have hardly taken into account the existing inequalities between women and men, for example, in the labor market, as well as in the tax and social system. And it's also expected that the implementation of the recovery packages will further increase imbalances in the equality of men and women in Germany too. According to the new study conducted by Irene Pimminger this year, only about a quarter of the measures in the German recovery plan with a quarter of the funding volume are expected to contribute to the goals of the national gender equality strategy. In her analysis, Piminger concludes that of the measures analyzed from the gender equality chapter of the German recovery plan, only one measure, only one measure is classified as a specific gender equality measure with a contribution to the national gender equality uh, goals as its main purpose. That would make up 2% of the total funds. Three measures, which means 14% of the funds were found um, to have an uncertain gender equality contribution and of the remaining measures listed in the gender equality chapter of the plan, the assumed contribution of the objectives uh, to the objectives of the national gender equality strategy is not assessed as plausible on the basis of uh, the ex ante impact analysis carried out. Overall, 36 measures with a share of 84% of the total volume of uh, the German recovery plan are not expected to contribute to gender equality goals. All in all, the measures are expected to perpetuate or even worsen gender-related imbalances in the economy and employment. And um, for those measures, which are not directly related to gender equality, that makes up 74% of the measures. Uh, the gender equality chapter states that the obligation to gender mainstreaming applies. But we have conducted uh, a similar study in Germany, the German trade unions, and the result uh, shows a similar picture. Um, so it's the same most of the measures are more likely to benefit uh, men than women. Only 21% of the foreseeable benefit is greater for women than for men. Um, it's a study of the Hans Böckler Stiftung, the Trade Union Foundation conducted last year in November. And this study shed a light on the effects of three central corona packages of the German government. Yeah, with the same results. So that's, 
the gender imbalances are likely to be even far greater and even worsen the situation of women in Germany as well. Yeah, and this um, most obvious gender related differences can be found in the expected employment effects. Uh, for example, 69% of the German recovery plan volume is accounted for by measures that are expected to have employment effects um, predominantly for men, also in the long term. And thinking about Corona, uh, we have had, you mentioned, um, Alexandra Giese, that women carried the burden um, of childcare and um, um, reduce their working hours. So um, this is exactly the opposite. But with the predefined focus on of the European RRF on ecological transformation and digitalization, the course had really been set at EU level, a EU level for a male employment bias. Um, as a large part of the funding has been budgeted for male dominated employment sectors such as energy, construction, transport, and information technology. And no comparable weight was placed on investment in the female-dominated care sectors beforehand. You carried out studies like Klatza and Rinaldi in 2020 that already uh, put a light on the danger. But um, yeah, this is especially true for the German recovery plan. And mm. of course, that means, as the studies results show that um, women have not and do not benefit from the recovery packages, but they do show that many measures were designed to benefit women less often and to a lesser extent than men. And even too, as mentioned, the decision had to be made under high time pressure. The absolute necessary and long since prescribed assessment of legislative consequences on equality was obviously not effectively carried out for these multi-million euro packages at all. Therefore, they are unlikely to compensate for special burdens that many mothers had to be here when they reduced their working hours during the corona crisis. This is an example as a day rather increased gap to men, as, as especially in Germany. And since we have bad um, um, infrastructure and care child, this is a bad uh, example of a gender blind policy that should actually no longer exist. And um, the findings underline that there is a lot to do for the new federal government to do in terms of gender equality policy, not only a much better evaluation of the effects on legislation, but also a policy that promotes more economic independence for women. In addition to further strong investments in public childcare, and as mentioned in the social and care sector as a whole, it also includes the dismantling of false incentives, incentives such as the privileged treatment of mini jobs, and also to counteract gender specific segregation on the labor market much more strongly than before. I will stop quickly, but um, we need um, a sustainable gender equality strategy and a gender equality check at the planning stage of all governmental projects. Also, this is actually what we expect of the federal government that uh, committed itself to progress. And we in the coalition treaty, they promised in the coalition treaty, they promised such a gender equality check for all government projects, but yeah, so far it has been left out for the recovery funds. Um, yeah, I, I it, the studies I, show the opposite as well, many exactly, experiments. Exactly, uh, exactly. Thank, thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Stockfish. I'm, I'm very <laughs> sorry to interrupt you here. I think we should we could discuss this, this for hours. I, I certainly could, but uh, we're really running out of time. I just don't want to, to repeat that point. I mean, economists are, it's very difficult to make them make their complicated calculation if you don't have evidence-based data. But from what you have heard, it is probably 
that the recovery and resilience facilities actively increasing the gender pay, cap, uh, pay gap by just investing into male dominated sectors without any measures trying to break up the segmentation of the labor market to give women really a chance in the sector to, to promote structural changes in the industry, especially in the digital industry, but also in the energy industry that would women really give the possibility to thrive in our economies, to give the policy, the possibility to grow in a sustainable way. And with this, I would like to thank all panelists very much. Thank all listeners for their patience and a hand over to my colleague Rosa D'Amato for the last panel. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much, Alessandra. I'm going to speed up uh, and uh, I apologize with, with my panelists. Uh, we're going to analyze the RRF and the national plans uh, on a specific aspect, uh, that is a uh, transparency and participation, which are key to us as part of a project uh, uh, that is the RRF and Next Generation Europe, which is such a high profile uh, overarching plan uh, that is meant uh, to uh, encourage inclusive recovery based uh, on uh, the uh, promotion of citizens. And if this project fails, the credibility of the entire union will be at stake. I'll leave the floor to Professor Gianfianco Viesti, uh, granting him um, a, a relatively shorter slot to, to discuss his topic. He is a tenured professor of applied economics uh, at uh, the University of Bari. You have the floor. Very well, thank you. I have shared my screen. Uh, can you confirm it is visible? I will just address uh, the territorial dimension of the uh, recovery and resilience plans. Uh, this is a very important aspect, actually. Generally, the reduction of territorial discrepancies and gaps is a key uh, component of uh, the plan, so because the condition of the places where we live have a direct influence on our well-being and welfare. And the disparity uh, between the places are just another representation of the disparities among people who live in those places. So uh, we need uh, to fight against uh, inequality and that requires changing the conditions of the places that we live in. Again, for political reasons, because people who live in the so-called uh, left behind places uh, will tend uh, to develop uh, a feeling of, uh, 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 of revenge and uh, will tend to request protection, um, uh, such protection being sought after with uh, 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 protectionist and populistic uh, uh, parties, and uh, um, no nation, since no nation can have a full economic growth without the contribution of all its territories, uh, that uh, um, this, uh, the territorial dimension becomes all the more important. Uh, let's look at the NGU. The next generation Europe uh, uh, aims at. Uh, uh, reducing the discrepancies and disparities between the member states and within the member states. Uh, how can we say that? Well, because it is allocating its resources not as a proportion of the population, but with respect to, to the difficulties of member states, such as in employment, and also with an eye to their need for a recovery. So it allocates many more resources to Spain and Italy, um, as compared to other countries. And so it fully accepts uh, the dimension of territorial discrepancies uh, as one of its uh, key pillars in terms of criteria. It is therefore very important, uh, as per the guidelines of the European Commission, that the member states will do the same uh, internally. And therefore, their plan needs to be devoted more than proportionally to the uh, left behind areas in, of each country. Is this happening? Is this going to happen? Well, it's very hard to say. What we know is that in every country, and there's a report of the Committee of the Regions about this, 
The plans uh, were uh, worded by the national government uh, with a rather modest involvement uh, not only of the economic and social stakeholders, but, uh, but also of the local communities. The other thing that we know is that all the plans uh, have been organized along the strictly sectoral lines, so they will always specify what needs uh, to be to happen, but very seldom do they say where this needs to happen, which investments uh, uh, will have to be to happen, but not where they will need to happen. So if we look at, uh, at these plans, so there are difficulties in Spain, for instance, there's a very important document that illustrates the political criteria based on which the uh, investments will be broken down and allocated uh, to the various autonomous communities in Italy uh, because of the size of the plan. Uh, which is pretty uh, big, uh, uh, there's a general rule uh, that uh, had to be introduced uh, that uh, states uh, that 40% of the resources will need to be allocated to the eight least developed regions uh, generally in the south of Italy. There are no political criteria uh, as part of individual measures, uh, but this uh, general provision will apply. Uh, Will this happen? Will these allocations take place? Will they allocate 40% of the resources to these eight region, regions? Well, we'll wait and see. Uh, the Prime Minister's office uh, has written a report saying that that is possible, but it is not guaranteed. Also because the administrations that have the power to make a, a decision on uh, these territorial allocations, that is, uh, the Italian ministries, uh, are Ado have adopted uh, uh, ministry level uh, criteria and uh, they may all be different because the uh, plan does not mention anything uh, on the political level on where to allocate the resources. It says that uh, we need to have many new uh, kindergartens uh, and especially uh, creches, uh, but uh, uh, it doesn't say that they need to be built or whether there are none. A very important part of the Italian plan is that uh, close to half of its resources will be allocated territorially through uh, competitive uh, tenders or calls of tenders between the local administration. In other words, the local administrations, the municipalities namely, will be required uh, to petition for, uh, to bid uh, for the projects and then a decision will be made on which projects will be funded. And that's very important because many local administrations in Italy, especially in the weakest areas, uh, have been weakened by the austerity policies of uh, uh, the years between 2010 and 2019 and they lost one third of their personnel. So one might wonder whether they are in a position to present uh, to submit these projects and have them funded. The risk, which is very clear in the Italian case, uh, is that uh, those projects will be selected uh, that will be presented by administrations with higher skills uh, and not those for those areas with the greater needs. In conclusion, we have uh, some first indications on that. We have carried out a survey on the location where more than 20 billion investments funded by the recovery plan to Italian cities will be allocated. What have we discovered in this report that we will present the day after tomorrow that there are clear inequalities in allocation. It's not so much an issue of north and south, but it's an issue of the situation of the various cities also Within the specific areas, we are very much concerned by the fact that in some of the weakest cities of Italy, very few projects will be implemented. In this diagram, you see what I have just said. On the horizontal axis, we have the level of well-being or income of the Italian cities. On the vertical axis, we have the investments in terms of euro per inhabitant of the plan. As you see, there is no relation between the level of income and the allocations, and therefore the plan appears not to carry out, not to provide any rebalance. 
which would mean allocating more resources to the weakest cities. So monitoring the implementation of the plans will be very important also in this respect. And cultural and political initiatives will be very important so that the weakest communities and with the highest problems will benefit from next generation EU. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. These are things that we have already reported and we will continue to report, though we know that uh, the regulation is not uh, favorable in this respect. Now I give the floor to Professor Giovanni Casale, European Council, Councillor of the European Trade Federation. You have the floor. Good afternoon. I share my presentation now. And I will try to be brief, uh, and now I'll switch to English. Okay, so basically, uh, we ran um, a survey at the end of March, the end of February, March, um, asking our our affiliates, our members' organizations of the TUC, um, assessment uh, concerning the investment and social priorities in the national recovery and resilience plans. Uh, and we also uh, gathered information about their involvement, either in the design phase or on the implementation phase. Uh, so I will skip these results. I will just uh, uh, let you know that th this report is available on, on the website. And uh, basically, we divided it in, in three, three sections. The first one um, is basically the, the investments for priorities, considering the six pillars of the RRF. Uh, then we have a section dedicated to the social priorities linked to the European Pillar of Social Rights. And uh, related to, to this one, uh, how and uh, what governments are doing uh, to uh, cope with targets uh, established in the Porto Social Summit about employment, uh, poverty reduction, and uh, skills. Uh, this just to, to show you what you will have the slide, you can go through that there are sort of disparities uh, that on the left side, you can see uh, the, um, you can see the, the chart representing the measures officially taken from the uh, resilience, um, the resilience dashboard for the commission, number of measures divided into the six pillars. And on the right side, of course, the trade union uh, priorities. Um, without going to the details, but going straight to the point, uh, I don't know why it's not working. So, okay. Um, yeah, then there is a breakdown uh, for both for governments and for uh, unions priorities about the six pillars with the top three, uh, top three um, policy uh, area. Uh, and here we we asked our our affiliates uh, to report us on um, the priorities, the social priorities linked to the pillar social rights identified in the national recovery resilience plans, and on the other hand, uh, which were the the principles or the pillar that, in their opinion, uh, should be pursued with uh, more urgency. Uh, this is the comparison, more or less. There is a kind of match, especially uh, related to uh, some uh, some area, uh, healthcare, of course, education and training, active support to employment. Um, so this is also maybe linked to the uh, to the to the emergency measures taken during the, the pandemic. Um, anyway, we found a kind of social mismatch uh, in the priorities, either for the pillar or for the ones in the national recovery resilience plans for priority for investments. Uh, in our opinion, uh, it has been said already, uh, there are no, no so totally clear indication of social objectives in the national recovery resilience plans. Uh, there is no mandatory requirement for social investments, while we have it for digitalization and, and green. Um, even though we know that globally, the, 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 the social expense or the expense for social investment, uh, it has been consistent, but most of the, the, the resources um, with with uh, with good reason uh, are going to 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 the resilience of the healthcare systems, um, and the third element, the one we will focus on, is the lack of social partners involvement, especially in the design phase. Uh, for trade union involvement, 
do you, do you see um, this is the definition that the TUC adopted several years ago or in the executive committee. Uh, Traditional involvement in the semester or now with the RRF, uh, any form of dialogue. Dialogue means two way flow of information with the national and European decision makers that uh, is meaningfully, timely, and with adequate capacities at, at, and at appropriate level. And of course, should be uh, should be allow affiliates, uh, TUC affiliates to work to try to influence the design and implementation of policies uh, either in the European semester that is now implementing the recovery resilient facility. This map has been, uh, this is the picture we had last year, exactly one year ago, uh, May 2024, at the end of uh, uh, the design phase when all the member states were submitting their recovery resilient plans. Um, and these pictures is basically divided in yeah green, yellow, and uh, and red. Uh, red poor, not satisfactory involvement. Yellow improvable or they just received the informations. Positive, they've been involved in the design phase, uh, pro also providing and attaching their position. Uh, I can tell you this um, is the picture back then. Uh, Couple of months earlier was even worse. It was almost uh, all red, and uh, that was a uh, pity. Um, I've been monitoring uh, um, the interdisciplinary involvement in the European semester uh, process uh, since 2018, and uh, till 2020, before the pandemic, the, the situation did improve a lot uh, or remained stable. I can say uh, here uh, in. Uh, last year, uh, during the design phase of the um, national recovery resilience plans, we we found that also in countries with a very good in, in this uh, industrial relation uh, uh, systems like uh, Germany, Austria, uh, there was a, a very poor involvement. Um, or in other countries where union where the government all more just set a mailbox for uh, for stakeholders to provide inputs for the national recovery resilience plan. In our opinion, this is not the way to consult social partners. Uh, that is why most of them are, are red or yellow. Yellow were they just were invited to, from the government to to discuss the priorities, um, not even discuss, to receive info about the priorities and the national plans without any possibility to influence the the plan, the, the, the design phase of the plan. Um, and this is uh, striking because we always uh, read uh, that uh, um, social dialogue is important. Uh, uh, the factual evidence show that social dialogue is useful in designing, implementing policies, reforms. Uh, and when, but when social partners are merely heard, this cannot be considered a social dialogue. Uh, this is why we need to, to make an urgent call uh, for the EU to invest in social dialogue. Um, because we see, we saw that in too many countries, uh, trade unions uh, cannot express their point of view because they're not either they are not consulted at all, or they were not consulted at all, uh, or they had very limited access uh, to information. Um, with the, the situation is slightly improved during the implementation phase. In some countries, we recorded. The, um, uh, progress uh, in Italy, Germany, the situation improved, um, but still there are, there are no common practices to involve national social partners in the semester of the recovery, phase, recovery plan. Uh, and as, so far, there's still no possible to develop an enabling legal framework for, for, uh, for all the, the countries. Uh, and still, there is no standard process to monitor the social partners' involvement. Uh, for us, it's sometimes difficult also to collect this data, even though we are working on on uh, creating a tool, a methodology to 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 gather this information from our affiliates. <clears throat> um, I just would like to I will jump to the conclusion in one minute. Uh, just to say, uh, yes, so final reflection, uh, in general about the RRF, uh, considering also the discussion we had uh, at the beginning of the, the event, uh, the TUC, of course, positively assessed the, the RRF also as a, as a tool 
uh, through common European debt to, to finance the much needed investments um, to, to, to face the transitions, the effect of the wars, uh, and the, the energy prices, all this. So it's also a good process. Uh, I mean, the RF built a process to, to evaluate uh, sustainable investments, sustainable public investments. And it is also positive for eventually the future uh, of the EU economic governance. Uh, we believe that the mutual trust and better implementation of the EU requirements uh, in the context, as I said, of the governance could be a good practice for the future. They are speaking about maybe in, uh, beyond 2026 to have a, a facility um, RRF like uh, to be permanent. We wish so. Um, the current ge geopolitical uh, situation uh, confirms the overall uh, objectives of the RRF, but it's true that most of them, as been discussed before, uh, some member states could be could pr prioritize strategic and energy autonomy. So in, could re redirect also through the Repower EU uh, chapter um, some of the, the investments. Uh, anyway, policies and investments for the twin transitions uh, need to be reinforced, in our opinion, to create uh, a, a bigger strategy uh, to achieve this, this autonomy. Uh, we, we recorded this um, uh, increasing demand for, uh, for security, uh, that the speeding investments in defense, the carbonization and technological progress. Uh, progress. For us, security is, it means uh, maintaining peace and preserving, uh, uh, of course, protection against external factors. Uh, but also reinforcing the economic energy and food autonomy. Then reinforcing the social protection and healthcare system after two years of pandemic, uh, and uh, reinforcing the social uh, territorial cohesion. Uh, keeping social cohesion is as important as reacting to fast changes, uh, we, we believe. And uh, Sorry, Giovanni, 10 seconds. I, I, I finished, I finished, 10 seconds. Uh, we know the Commission is committed to, to promote social dialogue and they are directly involving the national social partners, even though they are stakeholders event, so they are not respecting the prerogative of social partners on such, such uh, um, topic or reforms. Uh, we think in some of the plan we need to respect the, social, the, the outcomes of social dialogue at national level, as we did, as they did in Spain, for instance, with the labor market reform. Uh, we, are, we, we are waiting for the communication, the proposal, uh, uh, the Commission will publish it by the end of the year on the targeting social dialogue at the European national level, where we will hope to see a binding rule for governments or a common framework for governments to, to, uh, to involve the partners in the drafting and implementation of either resilience, uh, recovery resilient plans or national reform programs in, in, the, in the semester. There is no need for a standard process which means respecting national practices, but we need to ensure quality criteria involvement for uh, all uh, in, in all the member states. Thanks. Thank you, Giovanni. Sorry. Uh, now I uh, I uh, pass the floor to Valentina Guerra, okay, policy advisor of SB United. Valentina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rosa, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, especially to take part in this very timely event. I will be very short uh, because, in general, we share the, the same picture that Giovanni has just uh, uh, presented. I will quick, very quickly share a PowerPoint. Uh, with very few uh, ideas uh, to share. So uh, last year, we also concluded a two-year project uh, uh, on the involvement of SME organizations uh, in the European semester process. And uh, following the adoption of the RRF, we also included in the project the monitoring of the involvement of SMEs organizations and social partners in the design of the, of the national um, recovery and resilience plans. The Commission clearly asked uh, member states to engage in a broad policy, policy dialogue with social partners uh, to prepare the plans. And in the guidance documents uh, on, on the RRF, uh, member states were invited very clearly to outline uh, how social partners uh, were being consulted and involved in designing the uh, the reforms and the, the project included in the in the plans. Uh, 
and uh, unfortunately the feedback we received uh, from our members despite such a clear demand uh, of the commission is that there were very poor involvement of social partners and consultations were went from formal consultations to no consultations at all and uh, in general there was quite um, a dissatisfaction in in the whole process so we conducted a first um, questionnaire in january 2021 and as you can see now a very uh, quickly very few had been had already received um, uh, a draft of, of the plan and in uh, in some other countries, the government announced that there would even be a, a consultation on the first draft. And in January, uh, all our members were uh, the, the rest of our members were still waiting for for a first draft. And the quality of of the consultation, I mean, in the end, there were no particular complaints on on the process. Uh, some other countries uh, complained about uh, the consultation being such a only a formal process with the very reduced possibility to contribute meaningfully. Uh, and um, there were the specific case of countries with uh, decentralized structures where the report um, was discussed only at national level and not the regional level, such, for example, Belgium and Italy. And there were countries where um, social partners or SME organizations in general uh, were not uh, uh, involved uh, at all. So, um, okay, the, 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 the final assessment uh, concluded, uh, conducted uh, gives really a, a mixed picture. And at, on average, it can be concluded that, uh, yeah, SME organization had not been consulted or involved in, in the drafting uh, process, except for very few countries. And um, yeah, the results uh, of our project then was to put forward some specific recommendations um, that I, I included here in, uh, in the slide, like in, ensuring a better involvement of SME social partners in the uh, structures in charge of economic and social policy and guarantee their proper involvement uh, uh, in the implementation of the NRRPs, intensify the dialogue with the European semester officers who play quite an important role at national level, and then very importantly, we, we never stop repeating it to enhance the capacity building of SME organizations and social partners um, to contribute uh, meaningfully and uh, timely, as uh, Giovanni also reminded, to the design, implementation and the better ownership of, uh, of the reforms. So um, most of all, we try to pass a clear message to, to the Commission specifically uh, to monitor the involvement of national social partners and of SME organizations during the implementation phase. Um, and to check this uh, on the basis of uh, social partner assessments and reports. So um, we did uh, um, the same exercise this year to, to double check if this, uh, the situation improved uh, in, a, in a member state. And again, we had a very uh, uh, patchy uh, picture of, of, of the involvement. Uh, the situation is slightly improved but still uh, the, the involvement of social partners uh, still lacks. Um, so it goes from countries where uh, the, the social partners feel that they have just been consulted rather than involved in the implementation of the NRRPs or, um, or social partners and have only been uh, asked to send a uh, contribution during the public consultations, uh, but then they haven't heard uh, anything else. Um, other social partners who were very much involved during the drafting, uh, they didn't hear anything from their member states, from their governments uh, for, for the reforms. Um, and then there are other countries where social dialogue is already quite structured and strong uh, where our partners, uh, our members expect to be involved uh, anyway in the in the normal legislative uh, procedure for, for the reforms. So um, um, just a few concluding points uh, for the way forward. So uh, as, uh, as a EU cross-industry social partner, SME United has always uh, uh, advocated for a strong social dialogue because it's the 
the way, the most appropriate tool to find the solutions for the economy to work at the benefit of companies and, uh, and workers. Now the European semester has taken also his uh, usual course um, and integrated the monitoring of the NRRPs and therefore we encourage uh, national governments to involve as much as possible social partners in the design of uh, much needed social reforms at the national level. We know that the level and the quality of social dialogue varies from country to country and uh, uh, in the past even some countries received uh, country-specific recommendations on social dialogue. Uh, therefore, we hope uh, that the two upcoming initiatives uh, on social dialogue uh, coming in the next autumn will uh, provide the right push uh, for capacity building of social partners and their more systematic and meaningful involvement. I will uh, stop here. Thank you very much for, <laughs> for the invitation. Thank you, Valentin. I'd like to thank everyone. This is not the end of it. Uh, we are just uh, beginning the implementation phase of the plan. Uh, so I hope you will promise to me that we're going to reconvene uh, to discuss the evolution in light of the studies that you will keep uh, uh, carrying out. We will be monitoring closely the uh, publication by Professor Viesti and also the report to be published by the European Ombudsman. We need uh, to discuss with you and uh, also we are the only um, democratically elected representatives of the European citizens and so uh, we will need your assistance and help. So each uh, uh, panel will give uh, uh, rise to specific ad hoc uh, uh, meetings and uh, hopefully we, when we reconvene the information will be better than what we've heard today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.